we stand and reflect as we read God's word together. This is Psalm 150. That text is too small. I'll read it from my phone. Psalm 150, David says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's do that this morning.
continue to worship on this Monday morning.
stars are made to worship.
today we hope to leave here having made you the king of our heart our life source the light in our lives the joy that we feel God Lord we thank you for these moments of worship where we get to declare not only your goodness your faithfulness but your love that you have for each and every one of us Lord we're so thankful we're so full of gratitude for everything you've done, for everything that you continue to do, for the fact that you said you'd never leave or forsake us. Lord, you go behind and before us. You're present. So Lord, we thank you, we love you, and we pour out our worship. And it's in your name we pray, amen. How many of you really believe that he will never let you down? Yeah. Tell the band thank you. So I got just a couple quick announcements before uh, I introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Serve the City, not to be confused with City Serve, is a Habitat home remodel that we'll be doing on Saturday morning. So we have about 100 open slots for you to participate in. Uh, You can see the QR code on the screen behind me. If uh, you have some time on Saturday morning where you'd like to go serve in the neighborhood, this is a great way to do it. Uh, The second announcement I have is about um, ACSI International Schools. For those of you that are thinking about opportunities to go around the world and serve as a teacher, uh, a lot of different ways, uh, as dorm parents, dorm assistants, spiritual life directors, IT directors, even jobs in school and finance operations. There's going to be a jobs fair tomorrow on the promenade from 1 to 6 p.m. So I would encourage you, if you uh, are interested in doing something unique like that, to travel around the globe to impact other countries, other schools, other students uh, for the gospel, 
this is a great opportunity to do that. Tomorrow, or excuse me, next Monday, our speaker will be John Talley from Roosevelt Church. He's a GCU grad. He's also studying for his MDiv. Uh, so John will be here next week. I'll tell you a little bit more about him. But our speaker today is Brian Hommel. Brian has been with uh, UPI for many, many years. He has been the uh, chaplain for the Arizona Diamondbacks for the last 17 years. So his wife and two daughters are here, one of which is going to be a GCU student in the near future. So tell her welcome. So Brian, this is the first time he's been in chapel, so I think uh, he's been blessed uh, already. So welcome, Brian, to the platform, if you would, please. Well, that's great. Well, I'm excited to be here. Um, I was thinking last time I was in college, uh, 1995, I graduated. So I'm actually getting my master's in clinical mental health and become a therapist. So I'm here at GCU as a student online. And there's been quite a few differences, obviously. Like there wasn't internet when I went to college. So we had these things called libraries and they were on campus and you had to have these index. I don't even know how I found anything. So as soon as I started this whole program in June, Getting into this portal really like kind of freaked me out. And so for the first like four to five weeks every day, I wanted to quit because I didn't understand what was going on. And then after I started to get a rhythm, then they changed the portal again. Have you guys experienced that? Is this something that I'm gonna have to deal with on a regular basis? Yes, maybe. I don't really do good with uh, like technology and change. So I'm just grinding it out right now for the kingdom. Anyway, so I wanna talk about since it's Halloween, we wear masks, and the real reason we wear masks is to conceal our identity, right? We don't want people to know what's really going on inside of us, so we put on these masks, right? And so when we walk around in our life, we have this projected image of ourselves that we think will be accepted, and so we put this image out there for others to reach in and, and gravitate towards. All the while, what we don't realize is that it's actually creating a barrier around our heart and around our lives, and we're never really letting anybody in because of this projected image. Because if they know who we really are, they're not gonna embrace or accept us, okay? So what I wanna talk about today is our identity. And I also kinda wanna share my story in this projected image. Like I had this image that I threw out there that I thought would be received. See, we all wanna be loved. We wanna be loved unconditionally, but at the same time, we also wanna be known, but we're honestly fearful if we are known, then there's no way that we'll be loved, right? So this is kind of our battle and our journey as we try to embrace others and let people in. So one of the questions I wanna kinda of do as a reflective for you guys is like, how many people know the depths of you? You know, how many people know the depths of you? I recently sat down with a player, a lot of things of what I do, I do a lot of counseling, a lot of discipleship, training these guys to grow up to follow Jesus and walk with him. And I recently sat down with a player whose life is in shambles and I asked him that question. He said, nobody, nobody knows me, but I want that to change. I'm like, good, let's do it. And so we're gonna talk about what that looks like. So my own little story and my journey, I didn't grow up going to church. I didn't grow up knowing Jesus, but I did live in a church once when I was nine. It was converted into a house. And we got a children's Bible. My mom read it to me once there. And then when I was 11, I went to a church camp. They, I got invited by a friend. I didn't know who Jesus was. They started talking about Jesus, so I'm like, all right, I'm in on that. And then I went home, I asked my mom for that children's Bible, and I read that every night before I went to bed for the next little three years of my life. My parents were in the restaurant business. When I was 13, uh, uh, I was washing dishes and playing sports. And the girl that worked at the, as the cook, she was married 23 with two kids. And the two of us ended up in a Best Western hotel, hotel room. And this obviously changed the entire course of my life. What I was thinking was gonna manifest in that moment clearly did not manifest. And I found myself in pain and I hid myself in the bathroom after we were together and I stuffed myself between the toilet and the tub and I assumed at that moment that God was through with me. The little that I knew of him, I thought I had disowned him in that relationship. And so I hid this pain and so no one was gonna get in and I didn't wanna get hurt like that again. So I kept everybody at bay. And the only way that I felt like I could embrace anybody was through my ability in athleticism and sports, whether it was football or baseball, 
Whatever I achieved, I felt like, oh, I received things from that, so I want to make sure I never failed. But when I did fail, it felt like I was stuck between the toilet and the tub all over again. And so I was carrying the weight of that shame, and that became my identity. I go to University of Louisville to play baseball. I, I get drafted, but prior to getting drafted, my life was a real shipwreck. Uh, I tore my right ACL playing a pickup game of basketball. I got suspended by the NCAA for gambling. I was a horrible student. In fact, when I started at GCU, I was already on academic probation. That just lets you know how bad a student I was. So it was like a mess. And uh, I cried out to the Lord. I had this situation happen to me. I met this girl from England at a bar. And we were together, and the protection broke, and it was this big mess. And I called my sister up, who's five years older than me, uh, later that night, and I said, my life's a train wreck. She's like, you need to turn to Jesus. And I'm like, there's no way Jesus would take someone like me. And she's like, that's not true. You got to turn to him. So I did. And I cried out to him, and he changed my life, and he pulled me out between the toilet and tub, only to realize that he was sitting with me for the last seven years in that same spot as I was stuck, you know. This had become my identity. What I had done had become my identity. And Jesus was setting me free from that identity. Cool story, two weeks later, I buy a Bible and a pregnancy test, and I pick this girl up, and we go meet at a Taco Bell, and she takes a pregnancy test. She's not pregnant. I know those aren't your typical evangelistic tools, Bibles and pregnancy tests, but that's what I pulled together. So we sit in my car, and I share Jesus with her for two hours, and it was really cool. She was like, well, why did you do all this? I'm like, I didn't know. I was only about me, and I was lost, and I'm really sorry. Two months later, she writes me a letter from England saying she was following Jesus. I'm like, who but God can do something like that that was really cool? And so when I think about identity and trying to project a certain image, uh, I actually got a buddy who has no idea that I'm doing this, but Tyler, can you come up? Can you get a mic? And before he does that, uh, as you walk up, come on up. Uh, Box, I want to give a shout out. Happy birthday. Where you at? Box? All right. So Tyler Keel is one of my good friends, and I've been, we've spent a lot of life together, and I didn't plan on doing this, but as I was praying, I felt like the Spirit's like, let's get Tyler a shot up here. So Tyler, we talk about like a projected image, but can you share your story? Yeah. Um, so, uh, hey guys, I didn't know I was doing this, so you know, I'm trying to adjust myself. Um, but yeah, so um, I grew up in the Southeast United States, the Bible Belt capital. So I was around church, I was never in church. Um, so I grew up knowing the stories, I grew up kind of projecting that image that I knew Jesus. And I could tell you whatever Bible story that was in the children's book, maybe that you read. And I was good at it, and I was good at sports, and I was good in school. Uh, but inside my home uh, was a fire, and it was burning, and, and it kept burning, and it kept burning. My dad was really into uh, just drugs and alcohol, and my mom got really sick with a brain aneurysm while I was a freshman in high school. She was bedridden all through high school and college and actually in pro ball too. And my dad started taking my mom's narcotics and her, and all her drugs and our family was just crying out for someone to come help us. But our whole family was like, Tyler, you're the oldest, you're the golden child. You need to keep the mask on. You need not let anybody in because if someone lets you in, they're gonna see the fire inside your home. We can't let that happen. So my dad taught us really well how to work a room, how to make sure that no one saw what was going on. And so during that time, I was in so much pain, just desperately crying out for someone to come just seek me because I was seeking my dad. He was running away from me. My mom was seeking my dad and she came, ran to me. So I was pouring out my love while my dad was just doing his own thing. And so that inside, I, everything was internalized. Everything, I was getting into things that only I knew of, no one would know of. And it just burned something in my heart that I couldn't even, couldn't even know what I was doing. Um, I ended up uh, going to school, play baseball, uh, met my wife in college, and then um, I was leading Bible studies. I was leading the athletes in action, but I still was desperately trying to seek someone to pursue me. I didn't let Jesus do that. I just knew enough about him and I wanted to know more about him to let him do that. Um, I ended up getting drafted in Missoula, Montana. Um, if anyone's been there, it's so beautiful. 
I was so, I got drafted a day later. I got sent to Missoula, Montana with 30 different players. I didn't know I was living in an apartment with six other players sleeping on an air mattress. That's minor league baseball for you. It's not, not great. And so I was sleeping on this air mattress and I would go, I'm more introverted at heart. So I would go along this river that was right behind our field to go read. And there was this homeless man that would come and he came and started talking to me. Again, I'm introverted. So I'm like, dude, please stop talking to me. You know, I'm gonna let me read my book. And he kept talking to me, kept talking to me. And I was like, all right, man, I'll, I'll, I'll engage. So I was like asking him some questions. Hey, what's your name? And his name was Benaiah. And for y'all who know, you know, David's Mighty Men, that was one of David's Mighty Men. And crazy enough, I just read a book, a, a fictional book about Benaiah. I was like, I wanna be that guy. I wanna be strong and brave and well-known and someone that people look up to. And his name was Benaiah. And then we had about to go to the field, I asked him where he was from. And he said, um, I'm not from here, I'm from above. And of course, if y'all are thinking what I thought of, I was scared to ask him what he meant by that. Not because if he said like, you know, whatever he said, but if he said, yes, he's from heaven, I would have freaked out. So I just didn't say anything. So I went back to the field, went back to the field. And then that night I was praying in bed on my air mattress with six other guys next to me. I was like, Lord, if you want me to speak to that man, please let him be there the next day. We had an off day. And so I biked there and he was there. And long story short, we spoke for six hours in the river of Missoula, Montana, this homeless man. Um, he was dirty. He had a tall boy in his hand, but he spoke to me like I've never been spoken before. He pursued me like I've never been pursued before. And after the end of the whole conversation, he said some things that's happened to me in my life. But at the end of the whole conversation, he said, Tyler, get to know the Savior you claim to follow. Quit sitting on the fence. He's, he's right there waiting for you. He's sitting between the toilet and the tub. He's right there. I know your pain. Go to him, get to know him. You know, not just know about him, get to know him, pursue a relationship with him. So I did. I started reading the gospels with like a new light that I've never seen before. And then two months later, my dad overdosed and died. And that would have been the storm that would have drowned me instead of the storm that like propelled my walk with Jesus. And I wanted more of him that I've ever had before. And I remember this one, this last part of it, one part of, of this, we were surrounded my dad's um, hospital bed. I have two little brothers and little sister. And I was like, let's pray. So we gathered around my, my dad's hospital bed. I was like, this is not going to define us. When we leave this hospital room, there's so many things that could happen. The enemy is gonna pursue us and give us lives of what happened to our dad. But Jesus is right there and he's right here in this room right now. And let's hold on to him, let's run to him, let's grasp to him. And so then my life forever changed from that moment. I actually met Brian that spring training and he started pursuing me <laughs> and he's still pursuing me. And now I'm up here talking because of his pursuit of me and of Jesus. So, um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of identity, man, like it's just crazy when you put your hope and your identity in Jesus, how you can walk up on stage like this and I can talk about it because I'm not scared about what you think believe it or not, because I more care about what my heavenly father and Jesus thinks of me. And that's the most important thing. That's great. That away. Good job, bud. He's... <laughs> uh, I kept like, Jesus, is this what you want? Yes, yes, all right, I'm all in. Let's go. He's the best. Um, so how do we break free? How do we get rid of these masks? How do we live vulnerable with each other? You know, how do we get to that place? So I want to kind of give you three basic needs that all human beings have. The first one is we need to be convinced that we are loved without conditions, that we are accepted as who we are and that Christ loves us. Psalm 32 talks about this. David writes this out. Blessed is man whose transgressions are forgiven able to be able to come before the Lord in April of 93 and just cry out to him and have my sins forgiven. What a blessing that was for my soul as I was able to engage Jesus in this way and realizing that I had a projected image on God. I projected this. When I felt, when I did good, I thought God would love me. And when I did bad, I thought God would be dis disown me. 
That was my understanding of God. I had projected that image on him because that's how I felt. When I did good, I felt good. And when I did bad, I felt bad. So I assumed because of what I had done in my life that God was through with me, you know, that he was done with me because of that. And so I had projected this image that I felt on myself, I projected onto God. And God does not like that. He does not like that. We need to know who he is and what he is like. Psalm 34, 6, Moses speaks about this. He said, because Moses is going up and down from Mount Sinai, and the people want to know who God is and what he is like. And God answers that question to Moses, and he says, you tell the people this. I'm kind and compassionate. I'm slow to anger. I'm rich in steadfast love and faithfulness, and I'm forgiving for thousands of generations. This is who our Heavenly Father is. And so I need to first recognize that I am loved by him without strings attached, without conditions, that I am overwhelmed by his love. The second thing is we need to be convinced that we are important, worthwhile, capable, and special. These are the basic needs for all human beings, right? I need to, be, I need to know this, you know. Your generation's an important generation. You are special. You have gifts. You have skills that God has given you. And he's rising you up, and he wants you to partner with him to fill the earth with his image and his glory. And it's our job as these people of God who follow Jesus that he partners with us us, in this way so that we can let the world know who God is and what he is like. And when we think about this, the fact that in Zephaniah 3.17 that God literally sings over us, that he has a song for us. Third thing, we need to be convinced that we're not uh, alone to face life's problems, that we're not alone. We live in a very disconnected time, right? We live in a very disinterested time and a very distracted time. They would put out on television, alone together. I'm really glad that you're all here today, and I'm glad you're on campus, and I'm glad that you're here fighting for relationships because you need to do that, because you're not left here to do this alone. Jesus said this before he went up into heaven. I am with you always. I am with you always. I had thought for years that I was by myself between that toilet and the tub, but Jesus was with me the whole time. I just wasn't aware of it. And as I move into Jesus, as I draw near to him, it says in James 4, 8, he'll draw near to me. So we need to be convinced of this, of these three things. So who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? This is philosophy's big three questions, right? Philosophy's greatest struggle is death. It has no things, no answers for death, right? Because philosophy is a study of life. So who am I? Well, for years I identified myself as a professional baseball player. After I came to know Jesus, Jesus brought somebody, two brothers in my life that were really strategic. They helped me in my journey to understand who I am. He wasn't gonna leave me alone. He was gonna walk alongside of me. He brought Mark Dwyer and Brian Dwyer and his daughter Michaela's here. And these two guys poured into me. I would go to the field and play baseball. They were getting their masters in mathematics, which I knew nothing about. But I would go over to their house every day, stop them from studying because I never studied, which is not a good thing. You should study. And I would tap my keys on their window, and everybody would stop and meet me in the living room. We'd play Pinochle, which is an old person's card game. But they had poured into me. They taught me what life was like. They loved me. They showed me the ways of Jesus. They helped me understand who I am, you know? as they loved on me, just as Tyler has experienced himself. So who are we? John 1, 12 says, to all who believe in him, to those that received him, we have been given the right to become children of God. Because of what Jesus has done, I have a new identity, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, right? For a new creation. I'm a new creation. I'm no longer defined by the toilet and the tub. I'm defined by the blood of Christ and what he has done for me. When we grasp that and understand that and engage in that identity, As Tyler said, he can walk up here as an introvert and speak to people he doesn't know and not be afraid. Secondly, why am I here? Ephesians 2.10 says that we are prepared in advance for good works. God partnered with Adam, and Adam's job was to represent to the world who God is and what he is like. As he bears his image, his job was to fill the earth with the image of God and his glory. Every one of us in here and everybody on this campus and everybody on the planet bears the image of God. Adam decided to use that power not for himself, not for the kingdom of heaven, but for himself. And as a result, 
We've all lost our identity, but Jesus has come to give us that identity back. And so now we have purpose. The reality is, is that when I think about who I am, that's an issue of identity. When I think about why I'm here, that's, in the, in the, that's about purpose, right? And when you lose your identity, you lose your way. And you don't know which way to go. Some of you are probably wondering, what am I doing with my life? Where is it headed? But when you engage in Jesus and you understand your identity, he lays out a purpose for you. Proverbs 16, 9 is really cool. It says, we can, we can lay out our plans, but the Lord directs our steps. When I got drafted, I wrote in my journal in April of 1993, or no, it was June of 1995. I can see the plans that you have for me, Jesus. You want me to make it to the major leagues and share the gospel with hundreds of thousands of people. This was my plan. My plan didn't work out the way that I'd hoped. But the reality is, is that God directed my steps in that. Now I minister and help ball players who have opportunities to share Jesus with people, and I've had the privilege of doing this all around the world. Now that I know who I am, I have purpose. And the last question is, where am I going? John 14, one through three, Jesus says, hey, don't be afraid. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And in my Father's house, there's many rooms. He's preparing a place for me. He's preparing a place for you. Our destiny is with the Father in heaven. So these light and momentary afflictions that we're going through right now don't compare to the future hope of what we have in the King and what he's set before us. But he has opportunity for us. So you may have vision, partner with God, develop this friendship with him that Moses had when he went up to Mount Sinai, spend time with him, embrace him, walk with him. And the more you figure out who you are as you connect with him, the freer you will be. You no longer have to be defined by these certain moments in your life, but now you can be defined by the moment of what Jesus accomplished for us at the cross. I don't know how long I'm supposed to go, but I don't have anything else. Is that it? All right, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.